the uh, great introduction um, and you know, thanks for the invite. And I really truly apologize for uh, giving a lecture remotely. Uh, I have my own teaching at NYU and unfortunately I couldn't really move that around. That was the, it was the first week here. Um, so next time I'll really have to be invited once more so that yeah, I can be there in person. I thought uh, I'm going to talk about two different topics today. I have learned already that you have learned about transformers and also you're going to have a fantastic lecture by Angeliki later today on what language models are and then what you can do with these amazing language models. So the first part of this talk is going to be somewhat short, but is on again about the autoregressive language model that has become a de facto standard in building not only language models, but any kind of generative models uh, these days. And this introduction is going to be more like, what is the most important core concept of, of behind the oral regressive language models? And based on understanding the basic concept, what are the limitations as well as the ideas that we need to pursue further in order to use, uh, build a better language model and also to use them better in the future? Now, of course, how to build them, how to use them, you're going to learn so much uh, more from Angelic later. So uh, when we say order uh, language models, uh, what do we actually mean by that? The basic idea behind language model or basic idea behind any kind of order regressive models that are very successful these days is to build a machine that is able to compute a log probability of any given instance S. And then where S is going to be a sequence in our case. And this sequence is of a variable length. So the size of the input can vary or the size of the input that we try to model can vary from one example to another. And this sequence consists of the tokens or the symbols that were sampled or selected from a finite size of vocabulary. And then in the very uh, specific case of the oral regressive language models, what we do is we try to rewrite this probability of a sequence into a product of the probability of the next token or the symbol given all the previous tokens. Now, this is just uh, how we use the rule of a chain rule of a probability in order to rewrite probability of sequence into a product of the conditional probabilities. In other words, it's just ex exact. There's nothing that we do in order to approximate this quantity. And now, of course, we're always going to work in the log space just because that is very friendly for our, uh, friendly for computers. So, you know, once we write, rewrite the sentence, uh, the sentence probability into the product of the next word probability, this becomes just like as if you're building a system that is trying to predict the next word given all the previous word. That is, given a prefix, so W1, W2, all the way to WT minus one, at time step t or the position t, what we want to compute is the probability of the next word. So it's essentially just a classification of the prefix into one of the categories where categories corresponds to each and possible next word. Now then you idea, if I had to build this language model without having to worry about whether I use neural networks or whatnot, what would be the first thing we need to think about is that the, we need to count. So what do I mean by that? We're going to build a table of all possible prefaces and their counts from the training corpus. So what you're seeing on the screen it would be the most, like the most straightforward, simplest way to build this language model. So we're going to go through the data set D. So we often call it a corpus just because uh, it's a text of the, the data that consists of the text. So we have a, a data set of size D. We're going to go through each and every example there. And then for each example, we're going to look at the prefix that is all possible prefix. So there wants to be capital T of them. And then for each of the prefix, we know what the correct next word is. And then we're going to essentially count these all possible ways in which a, a next word is going to be followed by a prefix. So it's going to be a pretty large table. It's going to have as many um, rows as the words in, the, in, your, in our data set. Now, once we finish the counting, which corresponds to training, you can imagine, we're going to talk about it a bit more carefully a bit later. What we, what we need to do is now, based on this gigantic table we have, so table of the counts, we need to compute 
the probability of the next word given the prefix. Because that is how we're going to compute the probability of any given new sequence in the future. Because at the end of the day, what is the goal of machine learning is to look at the training set and then based on the training set, trying to make some kind of prediction on a new example that we see in the future. Now, how we do that? We're going to simply do a retrieval, very straightforward retrieval. So we look at the prefix of the conditional probability that we need to compute. Then we're going to go through the entire table to try to figure out or to try to find the row that corresponds to this prefix. And then what do we do? We're going to retrieve the count that, the co uh, that corresponds to the next word, uh, next word WT, as well as all other possible next words. And then what happens is, if you recall from the uh, learning about maximum likelihood estimation, all we need to do is start with the count of the prefix followed by what we want to know or the, what we know the next word is, so WT, divided by sum of the counts of the prefix followed by all possible other next word. So it's just really literally we are counting how often this prefix appears in the corpus, the entire training set. And then that's going to be our denominator or the normalization constant. Meanwhile, we uh, the count of the prefix followed by the specific WT we want to know is going to be in the numerator. So in other words, what is language modeling? Language modeling is really all about count and retrieve. So we start from the training set that consists of millions, if not billions, nowadays trillions of sentences or the text snippets. Now from that corpus or the training corpus, we're going to build this gigantic count table. And this table consists of prefix and following next word and their counts. And once we build this table, in the test time, all we need to do is do the retrieval. Every time we need to compute this next word prediction probability, we do the retrieval based on the conditioning part. So the prefix in order to get the normalization constant, that is the sum of all the counts that corresponds to the prefix. So there will be many of them because the, there are many words that can follow the given pre, any given prefix. And what we need to do is using the normalization constant to divide the count of the prefix that corresponds to the next word we are interested in. And that's going to be our maximum likelihood estimate of the next word probability. And once you start thinking about this, surprisingly, it's very straightforward. Now, why is it possible to think about it from this angle com compared to, let's say, many other, let's say, machine learning algorithms or the algorithms where, uh, you know, or the problems where we apply this kind of machine learning algorithms or the generative modeling is because everything is crisp, as in everything is just discrete sequences. So we can do the exact matching very easily. So this allows us to think about the language model from a very fundamental concept. That is that the language models are supposed to count what occurs with the, what kind of frequency in the training set. And then using that information, we retrieve the relevant information and compute the next word probability in the test time. And in fact, this is not even a new idea at all, right? So this has been known at least ever since 1950 when Claude Shannon try to compute the entropy of English at the character level. And then this is the uh, excerpt from the Claude Shannon's paper from 1950, like literal excerpt there. And then if you look at some of these, you know, the equations as well as the ex explanations, this is exactly what I just told you about. Is that the, we're going to look at the prefix bi, and then we're going to look at the count of the prefix and that becomes the denominator. And then our numerator is the count of the prefix followed by the J, the particular next word that they followed. And then that is how we're going to compute this log with the base two because he wanted to put everything into a binary so or the United bits. So log two of PBI, so BI is going to be the condition part prefix followed by J, the J word. And then using that, you can now compute the what what uh what we now nowadays refer to as Shannon entropy of the corpus by going through all possible prefixes and 
all possible work that can follow the prefix. And then what he actually said there was that the, we can do so by uh, creating, creating and calculating from standard tables of letter, diagram, and trigram frequencies, where the trigram corresponds to three words as the phrases. Now, of course, if you go into the indefinitely large prefix, then we're going to end up with a table that looks just like what we just uh, looked at on the screen. Now, unfortunate thing is those tables tend to be really, really large. And in fact, having a large table has some a bit of an issue because memory is going to be an issue, retrieval is going to take a lot of time, but there is a, a bit of an issue with the generalization. So we're going to talk about that a bit. But then yeah, before talking about that, because my guess is that a lot of you have learned about or are very familiar with this neural network or the technique of learning, uh, not really as common. However, it turned out that learning these neural networks or the learning or uh, training these machine learning models is exactly equivalent to counting. And in fact, already the Yosha Benjo, you had the, uh, with, with whom you had the Francesco and I actually uh, learned from uh, long ago. Uh, in 1999 or you know, the 90s, he already noticed that the, well, hold on, let's not build a table explicitly. It's too expensive and it has too many issues that we need to deal with. Instead, we can replace this table with a neural net classifier. And then how we're going to replace it is to, by training a neural net classifier, by minimizing what you must have learned already is called cross entropy. So we're going to go through all the sentences possible from the true data distribution. Now, obviously we don't know how to compute that. So we're going to use some set of training data points coming out of the D. And then for each sentence, we are going to train a neural net classifier to predict the correct next word given the prefix. And then we do that for every prefix within this sentence. And then what this means is that the, instead of having a table, which is a perfect learner in this particular uh, you know, context, because give, given a table, I look up the prefix and then I know exactly what the next word is, or I know exactly the minimal set of the next words that can follow this prefix from my, according to my data set. But instead of building this table, we're going to build a large language model or the neural network that's going to count these quantities itself. And what that means is that they really, um, so-called neural language models uh, that we are very astonished by these days. Well, of course, the more astonishing thing is not really the language model nowadays, but the stable diffusion and all those uh, image generation models. But, you know, most of those models do tend to uh, follow the same kind of, let's say, idea, meaning that if we start with the data and then the data actually gives us some idea about the some subset as the input and some other subset as the output. And then we are trying to build a neural network that is memorizing or counting all those possible patterns and then somehow internalize it. So in other words, these neural nets just learns, uh, learn to count. Really nothing magical here. Now, however, uh, we need to think about one weird thing is that the learning is also not counting to a certain degree. So if you think about what cross entropy and then why we call it cross entropy, this cross entropy is a upper bound to the original entropy of the target distribution. So as you see on the screen, on the right hand side of this inequality is the entropy of the true distribution. So what does it mean for the true distribution to have the entropy is that the given a prefix, there are many possible next words they can follow. And then that is a key of generative modeling or the key challenge in generative modeling is that the, we don't have just one answer for all possible patterns that we see, but for each pattern, we may have multiple answers and then we need to get the proportions uh, by which these next words appear in the training set correctly. But sadly so, we don't have access to true distribution directly. There is a reason why we're going to now compute the cross entropy where we compute the expected log probability under our model. 
and then this expectation is computed over the true distribution, which we can now use the training set to, uh, you know, they use as a proxy. And then what that means is that because it is an upper bound to the true cross entropy, if you're trying to minimize this cross entropy by training a neural network, we're always going to get close, but not perfectly to the true training examples. And what does that actually mean is that the, the true entropy tells about the uncertainty that is associated with the true distribution of text that produced the training set. And now by training a neural net by, uh, to, uh, to minimize this cross entropy, we, uh, we are saying that the, our model is also going to have the uncertainty that is at least as high as the true distribution but at least as high. So it's not going to be perfectly matching, but it's going to be a bit more uncertain. And then what that means is that this neural language model is going to put very, very high probabilities on the training patterns or the training prefaces followed by the training next words, but it will also leak, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, leak out some of the probabilities to the unseen prefaces and then unseen next word as well. But there's a three three AM here, so so um so in order to talk about that, so then where does that probability go to? So this missing probability. Before talking about that we it's a good idea for us to talk about how count based language models themselves cannot really generalize. What do I mean by that? Let's think about this particular sentence. A lion is chasing a llama, which is not a usual sentence to re uh, write. Even if even now, if you go to the Google Ngram viewer, which indexes pretty much all the uh, books that have been published over the past, let's say, century or so, that a lion is chasing a llama itself has never been written by any of these literary books. When that happens, count-based language models, without any of those techniques, there are many other techniques that people have developed before the neural language models have become a thing, but without those uh, tricks and techniques, according to our count-based language models, the probability of a lion is chasing a llama is zero because it has never happened before. So let's look at why that is the case. In order to compute the probability of this sequence, we first need to compute the probability of R, the very first word, and then we need to compute the probability of lion given a prefix A, and then we need to compute the probability of E's given A lion, and on and on and on. And we're going to multiply all these log probabilities of the next word in order to get the log probability of full sentence. But one thing for sure is that no one has written llama following a lion is chasing a. This just ne has never happened. And what that means is that if it has never happened, count is supposed to be zero. And then if you multiply anything with zero, you end up with zero. So there is no kind of, let's say, inherent mechanism by which a count-based language model can generalize to an, to an unseen prefix or the unseen sequence in general. But it turned out that the neural nets can generalize because of the missing probability. By not being able to perfectly model the true distribution, that is, uh, and end up with a distribution that has a higher uncertainty, higher entropy than the true distribution, it turned out that these neural nets are leaking a bit of a probability mess outside what it has seen during training. And then this actually allows our neural language models to generalize to unseen sequences. And doing so, of course, you know, is, is not free. If we make a large enough language model, however large data we have, we can almost always memorize them perfectly. However, the fact that we use stochastic gradient descent and a lot of regularization techniques such as uh, batch, um, you know, say dropout, or you know, the others, or you know, the label smoothing in particular in the case of the language model. It turned out that because of this, neural nets memorize, but also compress. 
So it's not only just building and memorizing the table, the count based table that we talked about, but what this neural net does is also to try to compress the content of these count tables. And then in order to compress well, what it needs to do is to cluster similar inputs together in order and, and save the number of bits. And then this is quite similar to many of the earlier techniques pre, let's say, uh, neur uh, neural lang language models, such as Brown clustering, Latin semantic analysis, and others. And if you go all the way back, you know, this is essentially a nonlinear version of principal component analysis. And this similarity, so who decides what are similar and what are not similar? And then this similarity turned out to be implicitly imposed by similarity in the context or the next words. So what does it mean uh, when we say that, okay, so neural net memorizes, but also compresses the, uh, the count information based on similarity. Let's take just one very simple example. In this simple example, we have three training example sentences. And, and uh, those are, there are three teams left for qualification, four teams have passed the first round, and four groups are playing in the field. We're going to look at, in particular, these four words, three teams, four, and groups. Now, according to these training examples, if I look at only the biogram, so two, uh, one word prefix at a time, three teams appear. So teams, the word teams may follow three. And then four teams appears. So teams, the word teams, <coughs> excuse me, follows four. And four groups appear. So groups follows four. However, groups does not follow three. So then how can neural network or neural language model generalize to the case of three groups? That is trying to compute how probable group is following uh, following three. Uh, that's actually, a, there's a typo there. And then what it does is that the, it actually does so by putting three and four close to each other in this continuous vector space as a part of compression. And the neural net knows that it's possible to put them next to each other because both of them were followed by teams. And then by putting three and four together and then knowing that the both teams and groups were following the same word for this, this neural language model can now generalize to case of three followed by groups. And then this is the mechanism by which these language models or the neural nets in general compress the training examples. So then uh, what that means is that the, now conceptually, we can think that we're going to split out the very large count-based language model a count-based table into prefix, next word, and the counts. So we're going to separate out these first two columns from the last column. And then what we do is we're going to approximate the mapping between these two different subtables using a neural language model whose size now grows with respect to the number of parameters rather than the size of the training set. Now before, in the count-based tables, the table size grows with respect to the size of corpus or size of the log, of, uh, log size of the corpus. But now the size of the language model grows um, according to the log size of the model. Now, of course, this actually does imply why we want to have an increasingly larger neural networks because we want to ensure that our model size is large enough for a neural language model to memorize as much as it can from the entire training set while it does all those compression, thereby implicitly capturing all those similarities within the training set. But if you view it from this angle, still nothing too magical there. The reason why I'm emphasizing this not magical nature of the language model is because you probably have seen already online or you're going to learn later from Angeliki how amazingly magical these language models are. They are going to do some wonders. However, I want you to know that the underlying these amazing language models are this very simple concept of counting, memorizing, and retrieving. So then it looks like 
the magical behavior itself is not really the result or did not really is the direct, let's say, outcome or the effect of our memorization and compression. But inside this neural language model, what it actually does in terms of implicitly capturing similarity in order to maximally compress the input. So it turned out that there are two sides to this magic. One is the compression. And the, what is the compression is that you're assigning no probability to probable instances, and then generalization, assigning a probability to impossible instances. So what that means is that the magic actually happens here by having this missing probabilities that should have been assigned to the training instances that are being assigned to improbable instances or the sequences that were not in the training set and somehow this generalization or the leakage leakage of the probability happens in a way that just makes sense for us so somehow this process in the process of memorization and compression these neural language models decide to assign all these missing probabilities to the instances that just look very very reasonable to us now what that means is that we just need to figure out what are those improbable sequences that are preferred by our language models to the point that we believe these language models are doing some magical language understanding job. So in other words, this is not a not kind of a say, magic that we should be uh, astonished by, but more like a set of questions that we haven't answered yet. So let's talk about a few questions that naturally arise from this aspect. The first question is, what do language models choose to ignore? So one way to think about it is that, okay, we are letting our language model move some of the probability mass to the unseen sequences so that these models can generalize to unseen sequences in the test time. But what that means is that the, indeed, these models are moving some of the probability mass away from the training instances. And that means that the, some of the training examples are being ignored. And this is just a very natural thing to happen because the probabilities always sum to one. If you're trying to assign some probabilities to the unseen examples for generalization, inevitably the probability mass must come away from the probability mass that would have been assigned to some example, some training examples. And it doesn't have to be equally applicable to all the training examples. So what that means is that the, in this kind of lossy compression regime, some subsets of the training examples are going to be lost in the process of compression slash learning. And often compression in this kind of learning is known to forget about non-canonical examples. And the question that we need to ask is, what our language model chooses to ignore and forget. Now, one could think about doing a lossy list compression. That's definitely possible, but considering how large our training da uh, data tends to be and what kind of noisy optimization algorithms we often use, that's essentially some variants of stochastic gradient descent, it's very likely and it's very unlikely, uh, it's very unlikely that we actually end up with the lossy least compression. Then the, of course, uh, the other side of the coin in this case is what kind of, let's say, unseen sequences these language models choose to prefer. It's actually a very, very difficult question to even ask correctly. So some of, the, some of us in the field have been instead asking whether there is some degeneracy in language models generalization. So one question we asked in all, uh, earlier, earlier this year is whether the probability assigned to a empty sequence is greater than zero. It turned out that true. All these language models assign so high a probability mass to these very unreasonably short sequences, which do not ever appear in the training set, to the point that we can actually find that we have to use a lot of heuristics-based rules in the decoding process of these machine translation or language models in order to avoid simply having these models output null, null or the zero, zero length sequence as the answer. And then this is actually one way in which the probability mass 
the missing probability mass is being assigned. Now it turned out that the you know uh, you know hallucination that you have heard of and that is happening on the screen is another thing uh, where these kind of missing probabilities assigned to a weird sequences rather than the desirable sequences. But then of course at least we need to know what these degeneracies imply so that we know why the majority or at least seemingly majority of these missing probabilities are assigned to a very reasonable sequences that allow us to uh, allow us our language model to generalize. But then if you think about it, our language models are awesome because we can generate a realistic ending or the realistic answers from it. So where is generation? It turned out that the, there is one more component to this. So it's not just only about the uh, counting, compression, and retrieval, which should be enough if you wanted to simply score or to compute the probability of a sequence. But if you want to perform generation, then we have to think about it once more. And you're going to learn about prompting uh, this afternoon, I heard from uh, Francesco. And you the, if you think about what this kind of prompting is, prompting is really equivalent to selecting a subset of rows from the original table. So we're going to go through the original table of the counts, and then we look at all the rows that corresponds to prefaces of the count. And then we're going to retrieve them and then build a smaller subset of the table. And then that actually gives me this conditional distribution over all possible sequence continuations given the particular prefix. Now, unfortunate thing is, even this subtable is still too large just because the size of the table grows uh, exponentially with respect to the length of the continuation. And as we have learned during the past, let's say, two years of pandemic, global pandemic, exponential growth is extremely fast and is extremely detrimental for us as well as even computers to understand. In other words, we have to dramatically reduce the number of rows from exponential to constant scale. And by doing so, we can now inspect all possible answers from this constant size table. And then this is going to be important because this is how we're going to implement the controllability, although that's a kind of a say, longer discussion that probably can't fit in this lecture. In other words, uh, when we say generation, generation can be thought of as we start from the original count based model, and then we're going to get this subset of the prompt condition count table, and then we need to prune this subset of uh, this smaller subtable into a dramatically smaller table that contains the, only the constant number of rows. And once we have the constant number of rows, we can choose from this smaller sub, uh, sub table, like smallest possible sub table to find one great answer for a given prompt. So then the, where the magic happens is this approximate decoding algorithm that does this pruning. Now it turned out that you know, we actually don't know exactly what kind of pruning happens within these approximate decoding algorithms. So what we need to know is really to know what these neural nets, or at least what these decoding algorithms prefer to generate. It's a very difficult question to even answer, ask correctly, just like the question two that we talked about. So again, in this case, we look at degeneracy. So is it possible? So what is this distribution induced by this process of pruning by approximate decoding algorithm, such as greedy search, Tafti search, and so on? And then one question that we ask as well, uh, not, not we as in not only me, but you know, I did ask it and ask the question as well, but the whole community has asked is whether in this induced distribution, the prob uh, there is a probability mass assigned to infinitely long sequences. Because I don't know if you have noticed, if you try, let's say OpenAI's GPT-3 demo or the API calls, it's very easy to end up in a situation where the generation just never stops. It just kind of, let's say, semi-repeats itself indefinitely. And the generation only stops because you set the maximum number of tokens. And, we, and when you look at these kind of say, infinitely long sequences, you see that they start all fine, but somehow they all go crazy. And this is a one instance where this kind of pruning did not work as well. 
So just you know, they give the full picture of what language model or the, what it means for us to train and use uh, language models. What it does is we, it does the counting and it does the compression and then it is followed the process. Uh, those two steps are followed by pruning for us to be able to generate some text. So yes, modern hyperscale language models do wonders but they are still limited by the fact that we are using the very same set of uh, simple principles that were proposed already in 1950 by Cole Shannon. And a lot of seeming magic seem, uh, happened with, within deep learning, where we use stochastic gradient descent, tension mechanism, as well as other techniques of regularization. And unfortunately, many of the obvious questions have not been asked nor answered properly. Of course, the reason is because these questions are extremely difficult. A lot of work, uh, theoretical work on general, uh, generalization in statistical learning theory, as well as the general learning theory, has worked with a much simpler setup than the setup that we uh, have just talked about, which is a combinatorial setup. And you know, the, however, you know, the, the fact that the questions are difficult does not, should not deter us from trying to pose those questions better and then answering them. And furthermore, uh, there is a big question of whether uh, the current, this, this simple principle of count, compress, and prune is enough in order to get, uh, get to the truly, uh, truly the, uh, the art, true artificial intelligence. Perhaps we may need some, some more than uh, beyond scaling in order to move beyond the current paradigm. So before I finish up this first part of my lecture, I want to just you know, quote Thomas Mikolov, who is now actually working on what he refers to as, or the, what others refer to as artificial chemistry. It's very cool, you, know, you should look that up, but who was actually one of the pioneers of the neural language models. Uh, he actually said that in a thesis review podcast that is run by Sean Malik, who was my PhD student and, and is now a postdoc at University of Washington. And Thomas said in that uh, podcast interview that the real lesson is whatever works the best today is beatable by something we have to still invent. And to invent it, we actually have to try to work on something new. So it's going to be really important for you to learn about all these new techniques, but with the, uh, you know, with the, with your mind very set on learning about the underlying principles and then what are the fundamental limitations that are being imposed by these underlying principles and then try to come up with a new set of principles or the new way to view the whole thing uh, by posing a good scientific questions. So this is the first part of my talk. I have a second part, but uh, let's see if there are any questions from the audience that I can answer before I go into a more practical aspect of how to use uh, information theory for the purpose of analyzing natural language processing data sets. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Yep. Can you hear me, by the way? Okay. Yes, I can hear you very well. Nice. So uh, I was wondering if uh, all, do you think all language models fall under this regime of count, compress, and prune, like even transformers? and if so, could you maybe give some intuition into which step happens where in the transformer architecture, which we've seen yesterday? Yes, uh, absolutely, absolutely. So interestingly, you probably have noticed that I actually haven't talked anything about the transformers or recurrent networks here. The reason being transformers or you know, the, what we often think of, okay, coming up with a new uh, neural network or whatnot corresponds to a one small component in this whole pipeline. So what we learned about this whole concept of the count and compress applies to every statistical learning, uh, learning algorithms, including neural networks that include the transformers, recurrent SLS stems, and so on, but also any other approach that, uh, that, use, uh, that learns from data, such as support vector machines, random forests, and whatnot. So the transformers are going to be how we implement this black box neural language model that can be replaced with many other things that you can uh, as you can imagine transformers seem to do wonders the reason being that the transformers are not really just transformers but is the culmination of the three to four major uh, advances that we have made during the past let's say 15 years one is that one one is the uh, shortcut 
What is a shortcut is that the, we learn that the having many nonlinear layers often results in an issue with what we often refer to as vanishing gradient. And one really straightforward way to address this vanishing gradient is to introduce these shortcut connections that are often addictive. And then this idea of the shortcut connection or the addictive shortcut connections were introduced initially in late 90s by Jürgen Schmidtfer and Stef Hochreiter when they proposed the LSTM. It took us, took the community quite some time to realize that there is a really the core, one of the core ideas there. So, you know, the, we use it everywhere. And then one of the major ways in which these shortcut connections are used in these feed forward networks like the transformers is as a residual connection. So yes, that's the one innovation that's there in transformer. And second innovation is the attention. What is the right way to handle variable sized input? There have been a lot of different ways to do so. We can use convolution. You probably have learned about convolution already. Funny thing about convolution is that the, in fact, the convolutional networks that you all have learned can be trained to work with the arbitrary size images because the convolution is in fact uh, equivalent to the size uh, size of the input or the you know like the resize, resizing operator. We can use a recurrent network or we can use attention. And then in the case of the uh, let's say reasonably short sequences, attention is great because it really compares every possible pair of sequences that we often we use to refer to as the uh, skip diagrams. So using attention, very important. And then the third innovation is the normalization. So we before you know the one major difference I see between a neural nest that we almost always fail to train uh, until about let's say 15 years ago and the neural nest that we can train these days is the is whether we use those layer-wise normalization techniques or not, such as batch normalization or layer normalization. And it turned out that normalization is a key technique that allows us to train these models just because that they tend to make the conditions of these uh, loss functions much better. So loss functions are going to behave much more uh, beautifully or you know, gracefully uh, with respect to our op optimization algorithms. And then the last one is a stochastic gradient descent. This is the, all these possible techniques in optimization, but also at the same time, we understand it much better. And then we know now that we have to use stochastic gradient descent every time we train a neural network. So yes, transformers are amazing in this aspect. You already have learned about it. And transformers come in indeed in this picture, except that it is just a one part. And then the principle based on which we can train transformers are applicable across all those different types of the network architectures. Yes, we have another question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, in your slides, you mentioned at a certain time uh, where the approximate decoding algorithm, that that's where the magic happens. So I was just wondering whether you could prov provide some intuition in, into what's actually being learned at that stage. What, how does, because it's not actually magic, I think. <laughs> so what, what's actually being learned? What does that part uh, do or, or try, yeah, to, right. try to get. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, you know, there's no magic, right? So, you know, the magic is just uh, uh, something, something that, you know, the people like me, uh, lazy scientists uh, believes in because, you know, the, we are too lazy to ask, a, you know, good scientific question and then trying to answer them. But, you know, the, I say magic because we actually don't know what is the right way to analyze uh, these approximate decoding algorithms uh, in the context of these large scale language models. So one way you can imagine is that the, in this slide on the bottom half of the slide it is an illustration of how beam search, which is one of the most widely used search algorithms for these large scale language models or the machine translation systems in particular these days. And in this beam search, what, we, what it does is that we're going to look at one uh, position at a time, and each time we look at the position, our goal is to look at all possible hypotheses up until that position, and then trying to keep only the top K. Now, this process of expansion, so trying to check all possible ways in which the existing hypothesis can be expanded, and then choosing only the top K does remove a lot of possible sequences as you can see from the left side of this figure. And then what does that mean is that the, we, uh, this beam search is using some kind of a say pseudo 
scores because we never look at the score of the entire sequence, but we only look at a sequence of scores of the hypothesis or prefix. So it rules out a lot of, let's say, potential sequences based on what it only knows up until now. And then now, what are these things that are preferred when the model was trained with the full sequences only is a kind of magic there, as in your idea, we don't know what is happening exactly. We have some ideas. We have some ideas, as I told you earlier, that you know, there are some of these degeneracies. So the Sean Wellick, Wellick 2020 and 2021 are the papers uh, I'd recommend you to take a look at. And you know, in those papers, we have actually kind of, let's say, trying to come up with a way to theoretically, or to a certain degree, I'm not really a, theor a theoretically minded person, but mathematically uh, describe this phenomenon and then try to uh, address it to a certain degree as well. But still, our understanding is extremely, extremely limited. Okay, thank you for the answer. All right. Any questions? Uh, yeah. Sorry. No, there are no questions. Okay, so then let me try to uh, switch to my next slide. Oops. Um, yep, yeah, I'm going to switch to my next slide. I had it open somewhere. Oh, there you go. And now in the second part, we're going to do exactly the same thing, but you know, we're going to not look at the language model in particular, but more on um, the All right, there you go. All right, so we're going to continue this line of, let's say, thinking, the count, compress, and pruning, but then we're going to use it for a different purpose rather than training a language model. And to do that first, you know, let's try to think of this kind of, let's say, compression idea a bit further in the context of machine learning. And then that's going to be the fun background. Hopefully, you know, I won't run out of time too quickly, but you know, I almost feel like if we spend the next, let's say, half an hour fully on this uh, concept of the how programming, compression, and machine learning are all connected with each other, that's probably going to be more, uh, you know, in, in enough of a content. But then you know, at, the, at the end of the day, the content that I'm going to tell you in this first part of the second part is largely, uh, was largely explored by the Risanen. Uh, in 1978, when he wrote a really amazing, let's say, a paper titled Modeling by Shortest Data Description. So what I'm going to try to convince you now is that the, just like what, how I did with the language model, I'm going to tell you that the, now it's the, uh, the, even programming is also a form of compression. And then because compression, what you have learned, is a form of learning and prediction in machine learning, Machine learning is going to be also equivalent to programming as well. So we're just you know, pushing this idea of the compression further and further and further. Now let's think about what program is by having, let's say, two people here. So we have a Bob who is a very lazy user, and we have Alice who is an extremely smart programmer. Now, what when we say programming, what do we mean by it? In this scenario, let's assume, let's uh, imagine that. Bob, a lazy user, con constantly you know, at the, uh, you know, at the, um, ask Alice a question. And then we're going to use a very, very simple example. That is to count number of ones in a given stream or the se uh, sequence of binary digits. So Bob is going to ask Alice, how many ones are there in this first sequence? Alice, who is very smart, is going to count once and then return to Bob with the answer three. And then Bob asks Alice again, how many ones are there in this new sequence? Alice is going to read a sequence and then try and uh, figure out that there are five ones and will return to Bob with the answer five. And then this happens over and over. Now, of course, Alice being a very smart programmer, Alice realizes at some point that the, hold on, doesn't make any sense for me to answer this question over and over. Instead, what Bob can do is to ask Alice to create a counting problem that can be sent back to Bob. And then once 
at least provides Bob with this counting program, then Bob does not have to now uh, bother Alice any further. Bob can just run this counting program provided by Alice over and over in Bob's computer in order to answer all those questions that Bob would have uh, used to ask Alice. And then what this means is that the, this process of writing a program is an efficient way for Alice to share all those answers that Bob would, uh, answers to the questions that Bob would have asked. So Bob could, if, if he didn't have a program, Bob could have asked Alice over and over the similar question, but the same question, but with the different, let's say, input. And then this would have taken, in fact, an indefinite amount of, let's say, effort from Alice to answer Bob, to send to Bob. On the other hand, if Alice, who is extremely smart, can code a program and send it to Bob, then that's just a much more efficient way to communicate all those possible answers, including past answers, as well as future answers to Bob. Unlike before, where we now, uh, unlike in the original case where the Alice was just answering all those questions that Bob was sending, the number of bits Alice needed to send back then, uh, in, in that case, it was indefinite, right? It was unbounded. But now, unlike that, if Alice sends the program to Bob, the number of bits that Alice needs to send to Bob is now strictly upper bounded by the size of the program. And then if the, uh, if the F is the program to send F, Alice simply needs to use log two of the size of the program bits. And then that is the information, well, you know, one kind of aspect of the information theory there. And then in fact, if Alice is extremely, extremely impossibly good, then Alice probably could come up with the shortest program to solve or answer any of Bob's question. And then, uh, and that's going to allow Alice to send the minimal number of bits in order to send this shortest program that Bob can use in order to answer all his questions without ever having to come back to Alice. And then this length of the shortest program that solves the problem perfectly is called Kolmogorov complexity. Now, unfortunately, the Kolmogorov complexity is uncomputable. Now, it is computable under a number of assumptions that we can put in, and then it is computable if we choose the problem carefully and then trying to just find the shortest program for the particular problem alone, and that is not going to be generalizable to any other problems. But broadly and generally, the Kolmogorov complexity is uncom uncomputable. And then you know, the, here's an example of how you actually show that Kolmogorov complexity is uncom uncomputable. I'm not going to go into the detail here, but the idea is just like any kind of, let's say, computability or the impossibility theorem, the idea is to create a contradiction. And then how we actually prove that the Kolmogorov complexity is uncomputable is, in fact, identical to uh, you know, finding out all those, let's say, liar's paradox or the barber's paradox and so on. So then you know, the question is, if we cannot even compute this length of the shortest program, shortest valid program, why do we even care about the program length? And then why am I talking about the programming in general here? Now, it turned out that the, this view of uh, making a program and then Alice sending the program to Bob, the lazy user, instead of trying to give the, uh, trying to answer the user's question one at a time indefinitely is equivalent to compression. This whole, let's say, notion of programming is compressing. So at least would have actually had to answer all possible questions by Bob, which is unbounded. So the number of bits that Alice needs to send to Bob would have been unbounded. It's going to be gigantic. But then by writing a program, Alice is effectively compressing all these answers, even the future ones, into a finite sized program that she now needs to send so that the Bob can, as if, Bob can answer any questions as if Bob actually asked Alice every time there was a new answer. So what that means is 
all Alice needs to do is to write a program and then send back the program together with the tool to run this program. And then that corresponds to sending a compressed file of all possible answers, including the ones in the future, together with the decompressor so that the bot can decompress this compressed file and then figure out what the future answers are going to be. And then this is how we actually view programming as compression. So let's think about it a bit more carefully. So the number of, the original number of bits is going to be n times where n is going to be the number of queries that Bob is going to ask, so or the number of the answers that Alice needs to provide, log two of L, where L is the number of the length of the answer. Now, length of, if the length of the answer is L, of course, we can use log two many bits in order to send it. So that's why we need the n times the log two of L many bits uh, in the original case, where the original case refers to the case where Bob is constantly bothering Alice with new questions indefinitely or n times in this case. But instead, our goal now, or the, what Alice, a smart programmer does, is to compress the number of bits so that the answer does not need log two of L bits, but only K bits, where K is going to be substantially smaller than log two of L. And then there will be some constant overhead, so O1 overhead coming out of this having decompressor. So we're going to send a decompressor whose program size is fixed. So it's, it can be considered as a constant with respect to the number of queries that Bob is going to make. And then now the, there are n many question, uh, answers that Alice needs to send, but each answer is going to take only k many bits rather than log two of L bits. Oops, I, uh, that, that was my intention, but yeah, I did. let's try it. Let's try it, I think that's a good idea. So we send the decompressor, and then we're going to send the, uh, Alice is going to use that decompressor to compress the whole thing. And then, so we get a K number of bits only. And then based on that, the Bob is able to figure out what the answer is going to be. And then if the decompressor is a perfect program, what happens? This K, the number of bits we need for each of the answer becomes zero. Because just running the program with the question alone is going to produce the answer perfectly. So the perfect program implies that the perfect compression to the point that the anything we compress will result in a constant number of bits that is independent of the number of actual answers or queries. But the unfortunate thing is that we often don't know how to write the perfect program. Uh, until, until recently, uh, Andre Karpathy uh, used to work at uh, Tesla leading the autonomous driving effort there. And then Tesla's autonomous driving uh, you know, capability is quite amazing. Well, I don't own a car, so I don't have a Tesla myself, but I've, uh, you know, the Jan LeCun actually owns a car. He actually bought it quite, quite a few years back as a part of his midlife crisis, I heard. Anyway, so he gave me a ride and then he showed off some of these, you know, I did full self-driving cap uh, capability. And it works quite amazingly. However, it was also clear over that short, let's say, ride that it's not definitely not perfect. And then we have seen a number of the, uh, you know, the crashes or the unanticipated behaviors of Tesla over the past few years. So even with the smartest people like the Andre Carpathy, it's not an easy, um, easy job to write a perfect program for, let's say, autonomous driving. So we can't really expect that we're going to get the perfect compressor every time we try to send some answers to these lazy users. So then what do we do? If we don't know how to write a perfect program, what can we do? To talk about that, we need to talk about the predictive distribution, code book, and expected code length of it. So let's say there are only four possible answers, one, two, three, four. And then let's say the chance of any one of these being answered was just uniform. This is almost always when we start with, we don't really know anything about the problem. So we, we say that, well, the chance that the, um, so the chance that the, uh, the, any one of these, uh, and, uh, any one of these four possible answers is an answer is all same. Then based on this, we can compute, uh, compute the expected code length. 
So how many bits do I need to send on average in order to send the correct answer? And then it turned out that we can actually compute it pretty well ourselves. Now, in this case, it's going to be about 1.5. But the interesting thing happens when we start to know what kind of answers are more plausible than the other answers. And if we know this, then we can now compress the answer with the fewer bits on average. And furthermore, if you think about it, if we push it a bit further, if I know that the answer, answer can be only one, and then I know what that answer is, I don't need a bit to actually describe it because the answer is already determined. Well, what does that mean? Let's think about it again. Now, you and I are actually trying to communicate with each other. And then what we are trying to communicate is for me to tell you the answer that is one out of these four. Initially, you don't know me, I don't know you, so we can't really, you can't really guess what the answer is going to be. It can be any one of these four possible answers with the same probability. Then the number of bits we need on average for me to send you something so that you can guess is going to be log two of four. Or log two of four? Log e of four, or something like that. But then, let's say you know, we have talked with each other and then you, the, you know, at the moment you're actually listening to me over and over and you realize that, well, you know, the, this dude seems to think in this particular way. And then what that means is that you can now start guess what I'm going to say. So out of these four answers, you start getting a sense that this, some of these answers are more probable than others. And then in the extreme, at some point, hopefully by the end of this lecture, you're going to know exactly what I'm going to say next. In that case, what happens? I don't need to give a lecture anymore. I don't need to send any more bits in order to convey what I want. Uh, convey uh, the me. Uh, convey what I want to tell. What, what I want to tell you, because you already know. And then what this means is that if if we can make rough but correct prediction, we can reduce the number of bits on average for communication. As your predictive model gets gets better and better the number of bits that I need to consume in order to tell you something dramatically decreases because you already know what I'm going to say. And then what this tells, tells us is that the prediction is compression. And then we come back to all the way to the very beginning of our, uh, my lecture, that is that the, well, you know, by training a neural net to predict, it turned out that the neural net was doing compression as well. And then if you recall, why did we get to the prediction uh, compression? Because programming was an approximate way to compress the answers. And then now in order to compress them, we can use instead of programming a prediction. So let's you know, to put this into the same picture. We have a smart programmer, Alice. We have a lazy user, Bob. And then Bob constantly asks the questions. So Alice needs to sense Bob all those answers. So instead, what Alice is going to do is, is going to receive the M many questions from Bob, trying to figure out the answers to those first M many questions. And then based on those M many questions and answers that Alice has figured out, she is going to use machine learning to build a predictive model of the answer given a question. And then this predictive model can be used to compress all the future answers and then all Alice now needs to do is send the predictive model to Bob and then there is a process of Bob learning the how Alice uh, operates and then using that El now that Alice and Bob have the same model of prediction Alice now needs to send only a fewer bits per answer instead of the full number of bits per answer so the number of compressed bits which looks quite similar to the earlier on, is that we have constant factor that corresponds to the size of this predictive model and the code that needs to, uh, code uh, Bob needs to run this predictive model. And then we have the log two bits, uh, the, the number of bits that we need in order to compress this. And then it turned out that the, how well we can predict. So if the log probability is uh, high, then that actually leads to a lower number of bits.
because that simply means that the I know you know what I'm going to say. So if I'm going to actually say what I was going to say, that you know what I'm going to say, I don't need to say it. But if I was going to say something that is unexpected according to your model that I know, that's the predictive model, but we, because we share this predict, predictive model, then I need to spend a lot of uh, bits in order to tell you that, okay, here's something that you don't expect to hear from me. And then that's exactly what is happening here. And interesting thing is, if this predictive model is so good, then the number of bits that we can save is dramatic because that number of, that saved number of bits is going to be saved every time Alice answers Bob's question. And then that can go indefinitely. And then that is the idea of generalization. So I, hopefully I have established that, you know, we started with the programming, but the programming is an act of compression. So compression that is being done by smart programmers like yourselves or lazy users like me. But then writing a perfect program is almost impossible for many of the interesting problems that we want to solve. So we don't really know how to do the perfect compression. Instead, we rely on the idea that we learned at the very beginning of this lecture that the prediction or learning is in, indeed a way to do the compression. And this actually closes this full circle. Programming, compression, prediction are all the same or equivalent. And we would say that the compression and programming are from the software programming perspective, while compression and prediction are the perspective that we take from machine learning or more broadly, artificial intelligence. Now, I am actually looking at my clock and then we have the seven minutes. I'm going to go through this like super quickly, the rest in about two minutes, and I'm going to just get the questions on the first part and in particular, uh, the first part of the second part uh, to wrap up the lecture. I think that's going to be actually more uh, meaningful. So why, why does this kind of a, say the idea of the compression matter is that we can now use this kind of data compression for the purpose of data analysis. And in fact, if I just skip through this uh, motivational part, you can imagine that the, what does it mean for a feature vector to be useful? When you're trying to do machine learning, the first thing that you need to do is to try to figure out how to represent your input. Now, obviously people like me who have been working on deep learning, we say, oh, features need to be automatically detected, but that's not necessarily true because we need to prepare the input to the neural net as well. And then the preparation procedure is also feature engineering by definition. And when doing so, often we actually have some extra information or the extra knowledge about the problem to the point that they, sometimes we can use other subroutines or the other functions to compute some useful features. So either we give the input as it is to the machine learning model and then ask it to answer the question, or we can give the input to other external function that's going to compute some extra feature out of this input concatenated with the input, and then this concatenated feature is going to go into the neural net that answers the question. Now we can think about these two cases. Now, how do we know that this feature, this extra feature is useful? You probably can answer it already. Is that if we, this feature allows us to send fewer bits in order, uh, fewer bits in order for me or the, in order for a smart programmer like Alex to send to a lazy user like Bob. And then what does it mean that the, we need to send the fewer features is that the, if this extra feature added by this external function f allows this G1, this neural net to predict better the correct answer. So what we now can now do is to try to see if the length of this G1 that relies not only on the input, but also the extra features to be, to be smaller or shorter than the length of G0. If that is the case, then we know that this extra feature is useful. If not, if not, then that means that these extra features are useless and sometimes can also be harmful in terms of generalization as well. So then what we do is we're going to, but obviously you know, we need the optimal, let's say program G0 and G1. 
but we never have those optimal programs. And then the length of the optimal program is uncomputable as we learned earlier, and that is called Kolmogorov call complexity. And unfortunately, we don't even know how to program these softwares that well. So instead, we rely on this prediction as a compression or the compression as a prediction idea. And then trying to train these models really, really well and try to approximate what we call minimum description length, MDL. That's one of the most important principles in machine learning. And that is the idea that the, what we want is to build a machine learning system that is effectively describing our data such that the length of this data description is minimized. And then that is how the model generalizes well, and then that is how the model compresses the data as well as it can. And obviously, because minimum description length is equivalent to Kolmogorov complexity, it's not computable, but given a reasonable assumption of the limited hypothesis space and limited time and limited set of learning algorithms, we can approximate the upper bound to minimum description length quite well these days. And one way to do that very well with the neural network is what we call online coding, where Alice is going to send the learning algorithm itself to Bob. And then Bob and Alice are going to train these models simultaneously together in order to minimize the number of bits that needs to be sent or the spent in order to pass these models themselves. So we can literally share the predictive models that we talked about earlier without sharing the models directly. And we only share the data and the learning algorithm. And thereby we can actually get a very concise, let's say description of the data that is a good proxy to the minimum description length. But anyway, so I'm running out of time. So what we can do is in this idea of the reasoning data analysis, uh, named after reasoning who actually came up with the idea of a uh, principle of minimum description analysis, we can now see whether this external subroutine is useful or not. In other words, whether these extra features are useful or not. And it turned out that this is very, very different from what people have done with those linear probing as well as the various other techniques to see if some of the features are captured by these neural networks or some of the features are used by these neural networks. We do use neural network, but neural nets are here as, a, as our way uh, to compute this minimum description length rather than as the end goal. So I'm going, I'm going to go to skip and I can tell you a few things is that the, yes, these uh, listening data analysis actually does reflect very well the usefulness of these features. And we know that because we tested on a synthetic data set called Clever, where we have all these Oracle subroutines that we can use to augment the features to, and then you know, those Oracle subroutines are by definition helpful just because that's how they actually build the data set. And when we tried it with the multi-hop question answering, so if the multi-hop reasoning, uh, to check whether multi-hop reasoning is useful, we actually do see that reasoning data analysis correctly predicts that the, these kind of, let's say, multiple hops of reasoning for solving these complex questions is indeed helpful. However, when we use a large scale pre-trained models as the base, let's say, neural net to compute the MDL, the dramatic improvement disappears quite rapidly. What that means is that this pre-training of a large scale language models do learn these intermediate, let's say, uh, functions on its own and can use them when it's fine-tuned to solve these complicated problems. And then we test it on various other problems as well to get the sense of what these data sets do and what kind of features these data sets have. And then, you know, if you, if this is a paper from last year at ICML. If you're going to go read the paper, there are so much more in this analysis there that you might find interesting. And you have to be tested like the impact of the gender words, the impact of natural language explanation, the impact of the word level rationals, all of which never had a very clear, well principled or the, let's say, well defined way to check until this work. But by making the connection between information theory, machine learning, and the software engineering, we were able to come up with a 
but you know, the well-principled way to check these kind of features. So yeah, of course, you know, the, this kind of thing is along the line of this uh, related work on model or uh, algorithm analysis, model probing, as well as the data set analysis and understanding. But it turned out that the viewing all these problems from a different angle almost always uh, gives you a new way to see what kind of problem you're solving and then what kind of algorithms you're using. And I think uh, I should stop here and then try to see if there are any for any questions from the audience. Uh, thank you so much. I think we have time for just one very quick question. Okay. Unless you all want coffee. In this case. Um, <laughs> Thank well, you so much. <laughs>